Hello, welcome to Dorothy's Speed Shop. I guess the second, uh, my name is Nathan Millward and for the last few years I've been running Dorothy's Speed Shop down here in North Devon. I had bikes for people to come down and ride. I did a bit of reviewing and stuff like that. I had the Aussie Post bikes, the CT125s, then the full fleet of A2 bikes and also last year the full fleet of Enfields. Um, at the end of last year, I closed shop. I guess it just got a bit too big for me to manage single-handedly. And uh, I went back underground and got rid of the unit, got rid of some bikes, uh, but I missed out on having a premises. So uh, I'm in new premises now. It's pretty rudimentary. There's not much to show. There's not much to reveal. But I wanted to get, get back to doing videos out of the speed shop. I do a lot of traveling. My, my world is based around motorcycle travel. I take people on guided trips. I do day rides still. You know, my entire, entirety, everything I do is, is around motorcycling. I uh, just want to apologize for the summer attire. It is hot down here. Uh, but for this first video, I kind of wanted to just try it, do it as an episode rather than as lots of fragmented videos. Because to me, you know, everything bounces off each other. Everything's interconnected, whether it's the bikes or the kit or where we're going. Nothing's in ice, happens in isolation. So I'm going to try and meld together everything that's been happening this week, put it together in one episode and see how that goes. You know, we'll, you can be judge and jury of that. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, then I'm going to talk about this and this and this and this. So first up is the Motor Marini Xcape 650. It's nearly done 7,000 miles. It's my bike. This is a bike I paid for and run with my own expenses, you know, just to avoid the confusion of saying, is it a press bike, which I think people are suspicious of when people uh, are reviewing test bikes, because I know myself, it's difficult to say something bad about something you've not paid for. So this is my bike. I've been running it on guided trips last year. And in a few days time, I'm gonna go and take a group around Ireland, Northern Ireland. So we're gonna catch a ferry from Fishguard to Roslare. We're gonna do an entire uh, wild Atlantic way, lap of uh, the coastal island, around the, around the coast really, all the way up to Northern Ireland, then back out of Belfast. Um, this bike so far, in, in fairness, has been very good. It, it's, it's been a bit of an underwhelming launch. It came out last year. I think it lost a bit of, uh, fanfare simply because it's quite a big heavy bike. It's only a 650. Motor Marini's not got a great pedigree. I know obviously it's an iconic Italian brand, but basically because it's been bought out by the Chinese, people are very suspicious because it's a Chinese made bike. So I think there's a lot of reluctance there for people to buy into it. And at seven and a half thousand pounds for the spoke wheel version and 7,000 for the cast aluminium uh, wheel bike, I think there's a lot of people who thought, well, I'll just get a V-Strom 650 or a Versus 650, which I guess is a sensible way to go. I think if you're asking questions about long-term reliability or cost of servicing or retained value, I think you're, if, you know, if you've got those doubts in your mind, you're always better going mainstream. But for me, I just wanted to try something different. I like the fact that it's essentially a Versus 650 in chassis and engine, albeit with uh, a larger 19-inch front wheel. You know, it's a bike that Kawasaki could have built eight years ago, a decade ago, but obviously have never done so. So that's all this is, 60 brake horsepower, parallel twin, steel chassis, weighs about 250 kilos on my scale, so it is quite a weight. It's the same weight as my Motor Guzzi V8 5TT that I swapped this for. Uh, there's been people in the comments saying, what on earth were you doing swapping an Italian bike for a Chinese Italian bike? I've got to be honest, and this is only a personal opinion, so far I preferred riding this to the Motor Guzzi. I don't know why, I think it just handles a bit sweeter. And the engine is a down on power, but it really rewards you when you really stretch it out and make it sing. So as a rewarding rider's bike, I actually prefer this to the Guzzi, although the Guzzi is probably a better wafter, but this is a better bike for attacking corners. So, so for my type of riding, it suits me. That's not to say this is a better bike than the Guzzi, it's just that for me, it's working better and I'm enjoying it more. One of the things I've been doing to get ready for Ireland, I've been putting the new tyres on it. Uh, it comes with Pirelli Scorpion STR rallies, which are a very popular um, tyre for the adventure bike sector now. Pirelli owned by China, so I don't think you're getting an Italian tyre on your Ducati because they're Chinese owned. And um, so, but that, that, that aside, I found the, the Pirelli is a very good tyre, good road tyre. Obviously it's limited off-road. It's got a wide band if I show you. It's got quite a broad band across the front. There's no actual nobbles. I don't know if you can see that. So there's no real purchase on that front. There's no lateral grip either side. So on wet stuff, it's going to want to slide and push away. But I think for the type of riding that most people do on these adventure style bikes, to me, it's perfect. And the fact that the rear has done 7,000 miles, it'd probably do another thousand, but I don't want to risk it around Ireland. Uh, so I'm actually fitting it with the Anlas Capra X, uh, which, uh, are a Turkish tyre, which are growing in popularity for the fact that they like a cut price 
Anarchy Wild TKC80 that do a bit more miles than both and on the road are pretty good. I've had them on a CB500X before and really liked it as a tyre. Probably a little bit too knobbly for this bike because the Motor Marini XK isn't an off-road bike. I have tried it off-road at Sweet Lamb and on modest uh, gravel track, it actually works quite fine. But as soon as you throw in some mud, some slops, some ruts, then the weight of the bike and the lack of suspension travel and the quite uh, tight steer uh, steering angle means it's not great off-road, it's not great stability. And I, I just don't think it's the type of bike that you're going to ride off-road. So actually, these, these are a bit over tight. These are a bit too knobbly, but I ordered them for a 310GS. The 310GS is getting some other tyres. And ironically, the 310GS has got the same size rims as the Motor Marini and the Motor Guzzi V85. So we're going to pop them on. I'm going to take these down the tyre shop. I won't do these myself uh, just for fear of scratching the rims. But we've got, uh, what I like about the Marini, We've got tubeless spoke wheels with tire pressure sensors, which is quite a nice feature for a, a budget bike. So that's, that's how we'll get these on. And the other big change for this trip, if anybody's seen any other videos or Facebook I did, like, give me one second. Oh. So for luggage on the, the, the Motor Marini, I'd fitted these shad panniers, which were about 160, I think I paid for them. And then uh, Greg at Adventure Spec sent me these Magadan 3 throwover panniers to try. And I used these on a Scottish trip last October. Took a group from here down in Devon up to Isle of Skye, road-based riding. And uh, you know, these Magadans are a soft pannier. They're just a, a typical throwover saddle type pannier. Velcro strapped together in the middle. And in all in all, a decent pannier. They, they're kind of an around the world pannier. They were designed by Walter Kolbach, who was infamous for doing Road of Bones and that way before anybody else. And these were a pannier that he devised along with Adventure Spec, the Magadans, to be robust, easily fixed, and just a versatile, usable soft pannier for every, any bike. I mean, the beauty of the soft pannier is A, that it's light, B, that if you're crashing them, you're not, you, you've got less risk of catching your leg under it, or equally when you're riding ruts, and, and you get your foot stuck, if, you, if your pannier hits the back of your leg, less chance of breaking it. So there's a lot of benefits to the, the soft luggage. The issue I had with these panniers is, when you're staying in hotels, which we were, which is not always what I do normally camping, you're, you're taking the luggage on and off each night. And because of Velcro strapped, I find it difficult to get it consistent. And, and normally I'm in a rush in the morning, I'm organizing other people, I'm worried about what they're doing. And so for me, it makes me a bit careless. And what happened when I was coming back down from Scotland on the motorway, with a lot of heat build up in the exhaust to a sustained high speed. The exhaust melted through the pannier, or melted through the bag. And when I pulled up at the services, I could smell an acrid, acidic smell. I thought somebody's burning something there. And what it was, it was my expensive laptop that had completely melted through on the inside of the pannier. So the pannier was ruined and so was the laptop. So it was user error. It was using a product which isn't necessarily ideal for this mid-sized touring road bias bike. If it was a trail bike, no problem at all, because normally the pannier frame sits on the outside of the exhaust. You're not going to have that issue. But on these where the exhaust exits almost on the frame, unless you're very careful on how you stretch, stretch, um, attach these on, I think there's always that risk of, of heating your pannier and burning your pannier. And, and when I put it on Facebook, the number of people who said, yeah, I've set fire to tents and other things on their bikes were quite high. So, if you are going to wear soft or use soft luggage, be very mindful that it is very difficult to melt it, you know, and, and, and then it's dangerous. You're on the motorway and you've got your luggage on fire. Things can go wrong. So what I've done for this trip, because I've got the shad panniers on, I ordered a set of TR40s. You know, you can see these. They're a soft luggage with a hard plate back. So that clips straight on, which means that every time I put these on on an evening, they're going to sit exactly right. A little bit fiddly to get on. But that's it. Once they're on and, it, and you can lock, lock them on. And you can also lock the straps down. So for me now, that's a far better solution for, for on and off pannier. For road-based touring, I would say. You know, you, I still want a soft luggage. I still like a soft luggage, but I've got the the consistency of a hard back mounting plate. And, and for me, that is a better solution 
than those adventure spec ones for the type of traveling I'm doing on this bike. If I was going off-road on the Himalayan, then something like the adventure spec ones would be a lot better. You know, it depends what, what you're doing. Because the issue with these, if you drop the bike, you come off the bike and you break all those hooks at the back, you know, they're never gonna go back on. So it's about wait, looking at what type of trip you're doing and then putting the pannier to suit the trip you know, rather than thinking, well, I like them panniers, will it work for my trip? Well, that's the wrong way around. You look at your trip first and then find the panniers that suit it. So yeah, really happy with these. So these were 380 for the set, which actually is, I think is pretty fair value. So for 600 quid, I've got um, a rear rack and two pannier sacks, which are gonna do the job around Ireland absolutely fine. So that'll do that. And then this bike will go around uh, Picos Pyrenees, and the Alps in September. So all in all this year, do another 8,000 miles, do a Land's End Johnny Goats in August on it. We'll see how it goes. I think there's a lot of people who want to see these bikes fail. Um, I think, you know, they don't, like the, they don't like the idea of a Chinese bike, and I totally get that, given the sins of the Chinese government. Um, the slight issue with it is that any new bike gets lots of its parts from China, whether it's, you know, BMW or KTM, because his engine's built by CF Motor, who are building the, the entirety of the new seven, uh, 790 for KTM, the new budget KTM is built by CF Motor who build this engine. So, you know, where, how do you not buy Chinese? Well, the only way of doing that is buying second hand, buying a 10 year old Japanese bike where probably a lot of that componentry was Japanese. But whatever you buy now, whether it's a CRF or a, probably even a Himalayan, there's lots of parts, whether it's tires, brakes, all comes from China. So I'm not saying don't pro make a protest in your purchasing decisions, but be realistic that whatever you buy, there's going to be there's money going through China, the Chinese government, whether we like it or not. So, uh, I, I think the only thing I would say is, as an actual product, product and stripping away any issues of nationality, they're now making very good bikes. This bike handles well, feels good, it's been reliable, and is easy to work on. So, and I don't think it's in any way inferior now to a Japanese bike, and that's largely because the Japanese have. I think have depleted their quality status while the Chinese are rising and somewhere they met in the middle. It'll be interesting where we go five years from now, whether the Chinese actually do improve upon what the Japanese are offering. Who knows? But it's, it's certainly interesting. So that's the Marini, ready for Ireland. Uh, next video will be uh, about touring around Ireland on two wheels. Cheers. Okay, next up, something a little bit different. It's the Suron Ultra B. Uh, it's a bike that's just come out. Uh, it was unveiled at uh, the London Bike Show back in sort of February, March time. Um, it kind of took the market by surprise. It took people by surprise, but I don't think it, I don't think it's so too many seeds. I've not heard too many people talking about it or asking about it or inquiring about it. But for me, this could be the start of the electronic or electric trail bike revolution. Um, how it's coming to, into being here is a bit of a weird one. There's a guy nearby who works with Suron, the, you know, the normal trail or the cycle-based Surons, and then he happened to have bought this, and this has only been out, say, a month, and I was talking to him, him about it when I saw him, and then he texted me and said, it's for sale, do you want it? And I was like, well, I am curious, and I'd sold some bikes over winter, so I thought, yeah, all right, let's do it and try and do an impartial review of what could be the future of trail bike riding here in the UK. You know, I don't think it's there yet. Basically what we've got is a claimed 90 mile range, top speed of 60 miles an hour, a, a weight of 85 kilos. Uh, it's road legal, so obviously it's gonna be insured and, and MOT'd and etc. But for me, it's that, it's that sort of first step into a semi-affordable because it lists at six, six seven for, um, for a road-based version. So it's about the same as a CRF 300. It weighs about half as much of a, as a CRF 300. It's got half the tank range of a CRF 300. But for those people who want to trail bike for a few hours on a Sunday or to put in the back of the camper van, then I, I actually think this has got so much potential. I mean, I previously looked at the Zero, the FXs, but they're getting on for 12, 12 and a half grand. Now for, for a toy, that's way, to me, that's just way too expensive. It, it, it's just, you know, it's beyond my thought process to think I'm gonna spend 13 grand on a toy. But at six and a half grand, for a toy that could be useful and also more usable than a regular petrol powered trail bike, I'm very interested to get this on the road. I've not ridden it yet, I've only just got it. I've got to get it insured and, and get it out there and get it charged up. But in theory, it's, I think it's 12.5 kilo, kilowatt battery, so about 18 brake horsepower. Weirdly, you can ride it on a 50cc license, so on a CBT you can, you can ride this. Uh, as I say, it's incredibly light, 
So 80 kilos, it's got a reverse gear, it's got three performance settings, it's got sport, eco, and, and I think regular. And I'll try and do some close-up videos, but for me, it's, it shows just how lacklustre the motorcycling world has become in terms of a, of, of a tactile product design process. You know, everything feels quite cheap on a six and a half grand motorcycle. I'm looking at that KTM 390 over there and there's no real love in any of its design. It, it's kind of just, uh, you know, best of what we can do and there we go. Whereas this Suron, which is a Chinese, again, Chinese owned company, Chinese manufacturer, They've just done some, they've just got some really nice details. The switch gear is really nice. You've got a USB charger just down here. The fact it's got the reverse. And then when you lift the battery tray up, it's got a hydraulic strut to keep the battery tray up. It's just got loads of little design features. You think, actually, somebody's really designed that. There's been a lot of effort put in to that. We've got fully adjustable suspension, front and rear, a 19, I think it's a 19 front, 19 rear. And so is this the future, you know? Is it, is this it? Because to me, trail riding, I like to be discreet. I like to go under the radar. I don't like to bother people. Uh, I like to try and get on with walkers and horse riders and things like that. And obviously one of the barriers is sound that the engine produces on a typical bike. I don't have too much of a problem because I'm, I'm always on say a CT110 or 125 or a Himalayan, which seems to soften people's moods. But you know, none of those bikes have performance, whereas this has got performance. I mean, I've ridden it around the car park and in sport mode, it pulls your arms off. So it's got performance, but it's also got silence. And, and to me, those two elements could make a great trail bike. Now, the guy who sold it to me says on sport mode, it'll only do sort of 40 mile range, which you could do some lanes around here. You could have a nice two hour loop. But in fairness, sports mode is so sharp on the throttle, it's probably too much for trail riding. So in eco mode, if you could get theoretically to 90 miles, that's a, that, you know, that's a really, that could be a really good half day's riding. Obviously there's issue of range anxiety, and I was thinking about it today. Like, you know, it's all right saying it'll do 90 miles, but what if you've got a backtrack? What if you drop something? You have to, or you have to go and meet someone, or you have to go off track, or there's, or there's a road closure, and you have to go that little bit further. Uh, because you've only got sort of, uh, you know, so let's say top end 90 miles, it means that if you, anything you'd have to do in excess really cuts into that. And, and I think that could leave you stranded. I mean, obviously with the petrol, you can go out with a full tank, even on those CT125s, I can get 150, 160 miles in a tank. So you don't have any of that anxiety. So it'll be interesting to see how far I can get and how much I can use it before obviously the, the battery dies. You can carry around the charger, which goes under the seat under here, but it's a four hour charge. So it's not a quick charge by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I'm excited, you know, I'm excited because for the first time, and I'm not necessarily against electric, although I think the arguments for electric and, you know, saving the planet, et cetera, are a bit of a load of nonsense because you, you know, they're still going to make a raw product. So I, I don't really kind of see the eco side of it. But as I say, the virtues of silence really stack up in its favour. So the, uh, like I've seen Bruce Smart doing the Energica trying to see what those 20 odd grand touring bikes work like. And to me, they don't work at all. Because if you've only got a 40, 50 mile uh, road range, that's absolutely useless. But uh, say a 50, 60, 70 mile trail range, this could be it, you know? So there we go, we've got a, it's, it's chain driven. Looks kind of funky. You know, it looks like a trail bike, doesn't it? It looks like a trail bike. We've got some really nice features. Just bring it up a bit closer. You've got a nice cavity here. That's obviously where your battery goes. Although if it's wet, you're not going to want to put your battery charger in there. Uh, you've got a removable battery that you can take out and charge in the house. And as I say, 80 kilos. Forget it in the van. As I've just, I've already found, moving it around in the van, chucking it in the back of the van, on the back of the camper van. It's just a different proposition to a petrol powered bike. So, is this, a, is this the culmination? Is this, is this where we're reaching for, striving for in terms of the electric market? Is this the best it could ever be? No, the, but it, as a stepping stone, it finally offers some numbers that finally kind of stack up and, and, and gain some interest. So I bought this to try it, and it'll be an impartial test because it's my own money who's bought it, and we'll see how it goes. It might be an absolute damp squib, but if I go out there, make friends with the walking community and the cycling community and the horse riding community, and I have a blast on a bike that's fun and easy to ride, what more can you, what more can you ask for really? So 
I'll be doing, in the next videos that follow, I'll be doing, you know, first ride reports and then long, and then exploring different options. I'll probably put a novice rider on this to see how they get on with this compared to, say, a CT110. You know, is this the, is this a great bike for a novice rider? You know, who knows? I think what for me would be great is to see a CT125 with an electric char, you know, an electric engine, because then you've got the best of both worlds, a bit of practicality and a bit of uh, silence. So, hey, we'll see, Ultra B, cool. Okay, last but not least, a Honda XR125, probably the most exciting bike I've added to the fleet in recent years. Um, simple story, I was driving along over Exmoor, went through a little village, saw a petrol station, uh, and then I just at the corner of my eye, I saw that they were selling a little red trail bike, and I went past and I thought, I wonder what that was. Um, quite curious. Uh, so the next day, I had to go back up that way, uh, and I slowed down and I pulled over and I saw XR125, and it were a 995. So for the grand challenge, which I'd set up at the beginning of this year for people to go out and buy a pound or less bikes and going off on adventures on them, this fitted the bill completely. You know, I've got the, the CD185 Bentley, which is a great bike, but struggles a little bit on the trails. But to get this for less than a grand, and I had a look around it, and yeah, you know, it's not immaculate or anything, but it's pretty tidy, it starts and runs well, I thought I've got to have it. So I got a bit of cash, you know, as we all, you know, st st stove you away for a rainy day. And I went in and I, and I said, will you take a little bit less? And he said he will. So that was it. I've just been and picked it up. So XR125, learn illegal, it's got L plates on it. It's got 11 brake horsepower, I think a 13, 12 litre tank. So, you know, in terms of this or the Suron, if you just wanted to get into trail riding and you wanted, didn't, have to worry, didn't want to worry about uh, distance or mileage or range, you've probably got 160, 170 mile range in this. It's also nice and light, manageable, good suspension on it. It's a little bit heavier than the Suron at one, well, yeah, it's not liftable. It's not hard to lift, but it's about 120 kilos. So this, I'm just going to have a play around with it, see how it goes on the lanes, give it a bit of a review, um, try and get some novice riders on it, just see how they get on with it. But I think it's a, it's a great reminder that if you're wanting to start out in trail riding, you know, and I still see these posts, I've just bought a Tiger 900 and a Rally and I want to get do some trails, where do I start? Well, hey, you don't start with a 12, 14 gram motorcycle, do you? Not on a trail, because most likely you're going to fall off. But something like this, this gives you the confidence to go out and try it without worrying about plastics or damage or wig mirrors or weight. You could lift this off your leg if you fell on it. It's not gonna upset anyone. Uh, and it's just nice, light, cheap motorcycling, which is the greatest, ena greatest enabler of adventures to me. You know, something that's manageable and affordable and almost disposable. At this sort of price, you know, if it absolutely explodes on you, You've not lost your house on it. So this is, this is good. And it, it, it's a shame Honda don't bring anything like this. I see there's photos of the, there's a 150, I don't know if it's an XR, I don't know what it's badged up at, but it's, it's sold in Brazil and other parts of South America, which looks like a modern incarnation of something like this, which would be great if they brought it into the UK, but obviously they're never going to. But something like this, if you're wanting to do trail riding for the first time, you've never done it, where do you start? You start with light, low and cheap. They're, they're, they've got to be the core ingredients because I'm flat footed on this. I'm five foot nine, five foot ten. I've easily got flat feet on here. It's not too heavy. I could pick it up if I dropped it. The only downside to these older bikes, and this is, I guess, the, the downside of it. If you're buying a cheap bike, you're most likely to inherit some issues that go with it. There's probably some wiring issues lurking here or something. Somebody's had a, a faff with a carburetor. But if you can get a good one and maybe spend a little bit more, maybe spend 1,500 quid on a good XR125, a really tidy one, I think something like this would allow you to go off into Wales or Peak District or do the Adventure Country Tracks UK route and do it on a bike that really just wants to go and do it. Like this bike would take you on the ATT, that Adventure Country Tracks route, with absolutely no problems at all. I mean, that route's been sold as something for the big bikes, which a, a good rider on a big bike will be able to do. But anyone pretty much on something like this would be able to do that same route. And what would it cost you? A grand. So yeah, quite excited about this one. Just an impulse buy, seeing it at the side of the road. And there we go, we're gonna see what this is, this is like. So that's it. The only other one I wanna tell you about is Himalayan Hoedown, which was an event I put on last weekend over here on Exmoor. Just hired out a bunker house, which has got camping. So we had 36 Himalayan riders, one scram rider, 
Uh, we just had a weekend together. We had a band on the Saturday night of barbecue, curry, uh, bacon, bacon and egg sandwiches. And then we had a couple of ride outs. Saturday we did some road and some trail riding. Uh, it was just, it's just a great opportunity to get like-minded people together who share the same interest and passion for a particular style of motorbike. I mean, you could do a weekend like that for CRF owners or KTM owners or Suron owners or CT110 owners. It's really nice when you get together with those people and you've got so much in common, whether it's you know different breakdowns or different accessories or different changes you made to your bike. And so it's just a nice way to bring members of the same community together. And also we did some trail riding, which for some people, it was the first time they'd ever done it. And I have to say, they all got on really well. We had uh, a few tumbles, but I think that's to be expected on trails for the first time. But just people did really well. And I think they realized the potential that the bikes had. And I think that's, that's sometimes one of the key things that people have to explore. They have to realize the potential of the bike because once they've done that, they realize the potential of themselves. And then it starts to grow and increase from there, their confidence and faith in what they can do on their bike. So for the people who'd never trail ridden, they were probably a little bit nervous. They are probably a bit apprehensive. It's probably not something they would do on their own. But once they'd done it and see now they could do it, then it opens up a whole new um, riding atmosphere or environment for them to, to explore. So yeah, that was it. Himalayan Hoedown, look out for next year's event sometime June next year, 2024. Bl blimey, it's flying through, isn't it? 2024, crikey. So that's it, the return of Dorothy's Speed Shop in its new premises and uh, not quite as many day rides out, but I just want to, as I say, my life revolves around motorcycling and I want to just do a better job of documenting it and also helping people get out on the road and do their own adventures because obviously motorcycling is such a great thing to be involved with. There are so many ways of doing it. There's so many different bike choices, route choices, kit choices, everything. There's so much going on in it, so many events happening. Uh, so many different ride outs you could do, so many people you could meet. And so really I'm just going to try and do my best in the months that follow to try and capture that in more manageable episodes as opposed to sporadic videos which I always forget to upload. So that's it, Dorothy Speed Shop episode one. The second one will be about Ireland. Third one will be about prepping for ABR where I'm going to take a little fleet of posty bikes to the Adventure Bike Rider Festival so I can take people round the adventure track and demonstrate again, just what, how easy it is if you start with a light, low, cheap machine. All right, catch you next time, cheers.